Now, uh, the last part of the talk. In this part, we will touch on the leads of a few Pandora's boxes. In the first part, we set the stage by using the Heretic uh, short movie Unity demo uh, as a case study, as a movie done with game technology. In the second part, we sort of focused on finding out in which historical moment we are in the timelines of the history of games and in the history of movies. And then we developed some thoughts about first the tech, but, but then prominently about the grammar. How, what is the grammar of movies and what is the grammar of games and what they are gaining from each other. Now we will dive a bit into workflows and see the workflows of a video game production versus a workflow for a movie production, especially VFX-oriented movie production. And then we will see the workforce, so especially the artists involved in, um, in game production and in movie production. And we will see uh, about the uh, changing ship, so changing from movie to game and from game to movie industry, for whoever is in interested in that. And the last chapter will be about uh, uh, wrapping up some final thoughts and uh, maybe come up with a solution and answer to the meaning of life. <laughs> so let's start by uh, checking how real time is used in movies. The most uh, common usages of, uh, of real time, right, as of now is, is uh, virtual production in those movies that can afford this kind of technology, while the less common right now is uh, final output rendering, like final pixel straight out of real time. Even though some stylized uh, slash cartoony products already made it to the market, uh, very few realistic ones have been seen so far. Now the question is, is real time in movies that much of a universal blessing? Is it like just a positive thing? Is it that easy? Well, it does come with a few catches, okay? It's not that easy. Now the main problem is uh, always the same. It has been the same since a very long time and it's low polygon asset production workflows. There are indeed many technicalities and specifications and restrictions that need to be taken in account when creating assets that must run smoothly in real time. And there is a learning curve, of course, to this uh, that is not the easiest one in the world. But in general, the process uh, is fairly time consuming. We will talk about the imminent future in a moment. But for now, I will just mention the two potential candidates that might uh, unblock the, the situation, which are real-time micro-polygon rendering or real-time voxels uh, without sub-millimeter density. They are both just candidate solutions for now, uh, but there are some promising first results that are starting to show potentially the light at the end of the tunnel, but for now, as of now, summer 2019, we are still stuck with the old way of low-poly modeling and asset production. So especially for realistic looks, uh, it is still time consuming. It takes quite a lot of prepping uh, for assets to run smoothly in real time. So the important point here that I think there is a generational clash in this being stuck with old school ways of doing things. Um, the current methods do not uh, fulfill the needs and expectations of uh, new generations. The way we are doing things still as of today are more related to old school ways of working. And uh, this is why solutions are very important at this point. So let's talk a, a bit better about workflows, especially comparison between games and movies, which is what we're doing here. Uh, we've seen many times these sort of workflows that breaks different departments and how they communicate together. We will not look at this today. What we will look at is how money and creative resources are distributed in time in game and movies uh, when creating one of these products. So this is the waterfall traditional method, which is the old way of doing uh, movies. And basically here, every department is responsible to a chunk of the timeline. They have some sort of some overlapping, but generally the principle is that uh, department A passes over an output to department B, which carries on the work, so on and so forth. So business-wise, this has been the most solid and predictable way of managing projects so far, because you can, it's linear and you can lock in time different stages and see how the investments and the resources are being spent. 
But from a creativity standpoint, uh, this method is known to be pretty stiff. Uh, there is very little uh, opportunities to iterate circularly and to have uh, dynamic conversations and, and experimentation between departments. And when you start approaching the downstream stages of the production, it's very hard to change anything upstream without uh, things starting to go crazy and uh, having people to basically be forced to do crazy over time. Now, uh, we saw before how in the grammar uh, things changed so drastically just by, by the addition of the interactivity factor. Well, in the workflow and processes is the same principle. Games are different specifically because the interactivity factor. And because of this, while in movies here in the waterfall system, uh, you can sort of lock stages and then move to the next one, in games it's very, very hard to lock anything uh, because of gameplay testings and the results that come on iterations over the gameplay testing. Simply speaking, there is just an exponentially higher number of things that can go wrong in a video game and you only can tell after iterations of gameplay testing. Yes, prototyping of course does help, and iterating at the beginning with simplified versions of the gra graphics uh, does speed up things for sure, but when complex game dynamics and complex graphics and complex artificial intelligence start coming together, things become so complicated that you simply need more agility in the system. So eventually the idea of locking stages in video games, so getting to a point where something is locked and will never ever change again until the end of the production, is much more rare. Also we must note that uh, historically in movies uh, there has been a legacy of including in the process the idea that pictures come out of a rendering process, which is offline, which takes many hours. It's changing now, obviously, for faster response, but real-time response in games has been embedded in the nature of the work since ever. This is why the agile spiral production method here on the right has been the most common thing in, in games for a longer time. And it's actually something that comes from uh, Barry Bollem in 1986 uh, invented it, and it was related to software development. And games integrated it in their production system much earlier. Now, this should be self-explanatory, but basically all of the departments tend to work in parallel so much more and then iterate over and over, narrowing the fine work as the gameplay testing proceeds. So while the problem with uh, the waterfall system was uh, creativity being a bit stiff, uh, but it was good for the money people, well, this is the opposite problem. It's very good for the creatives, but it's very hard to keep track of expenses and predictions on this this spiral structure recalls much more the idea of artists experimenting with stuff and uh, that can go out of control fairly easily. While this waterfall method on the left, uh, you can easily put it on a timeline and split it into budget quantifications. However, if we go back to uh, a generational uh, evaluation, well, the method on the left belongs to the old school way of doing things, and the one on the right feels much more agile and much more prone to be accepted by the new generations. And thanks to real-time graphics, uh, this is becoming less and less of a question. And as a matter of fact, what I was talking about before, about the way we approached the heretic project, well, that's a, that's a dynamic and agile system where we let uh, the creative people experiment with compositions and stuff, having um, systems of assets that are actually modular and can be remix matched later on in production. We never wanted to lock anything final until we were in the position of making a call based on the lighting, on the atmospherics, on the camera positioning, and on the character performance. Now, we don't have to go as far as the idea that I was mentioning before with uh, emergent movie making, but we also have to admit that some of the main masterpieces in the history of art uh, are not the product of a perfectly pre-planned process. Sometimes they are the product of happy accidents and things that just happened in the process. And so being able to stay open to these kind of things uh, can make a difference. But eventually this process of roughing up the product just very vaguely and then start building the locations and then entering the locations to start experimenting with it and only then uh, evaluate what the next steps are 
sounds very opposite to the way of uh, breaking down and budgeting a movie which would start originally from a treatment then into a script and then into a screenplay that would just be broken down into sequences and shots and then budgeted and put into production and managed like that. And as of today, movies are still tackled based on a, a sequence breakdown, which eventually they further break down into shots, and everything is planned according to that structure. The budgets are broken down in that structure, uh, the tracking systems are built according to that structure, uh, artist reviews are or organized in that structure, the dailies reviews are organized on a per shot basis. And even production tools and scene assembly tools are tied to this shot and sequence structure. Well, as harsh as it might sound, we might not want to do things like this from the starting point. We might want to go back to a location-based movie-making approach, which is the original way movies were used to be made when computers were not around yet. Now, we're talking of virtual locations, of course, right? So, it's not that we have to imagine this like a step back in time. All of the limitations, the, the physical constraints that you have on a real set uh, are still lost uh, in a virtual uh, environment because obviously it's a physical space, but if you want to move a mountain, you will move the mountain. And to a certain extent, being forced to a more location-based uh, breakdown of the movies uh, uh, might force simply everything to go more into a sequence-based uh, approach rather than on a shot-based, which can potentially free up artists for having more control and more prominent contributions on the product. Now, this entire agile system is so much about creativity, but eventually a full spiral model, it is prone to shaky planning and scheduling, uh, and uh, it doesn't really live well if you think about it in terms of Hollywood budgets. A model that is too imbalanced towards creativity and experimentation uh, means that there are good chances of wasting money. But now this is a classic clash that has been there since the dawn of time and God knows if we ever will go away. But the point is that uh, artists being put in the position of doing their experimentation and doing the best out of their craft and artistry uh, leads to a better product, which eventually will lead to more money. At the same time, too much freedom becomes very risky for budgeting and planning and it can become downright wasteful, right? So eventually the goal will be to find the right balance as always in life. And I think that the balance here could be found by making the most of a stage called post -vis, which is a stage that is more common in feature animation and it's nothing else than an advanced pre-visualization. So post-vis means post-visualization. And while the previs is a very, very rough visualization of whatever blocks are necessary to uh, anticipate how the framing and the performance is going to be, the post-vis is actual real pictures that are being uh, put together. It can include lighting, color, materials, maybe not to a final quality, but it is something already. And thanks to real-time graphics, we could imagine a post vis that has the quality of, for example, The Eric. Well, that is a pretty advanced visualization of the movie because it really involves almost final uh, imagery. So the bottom line is that for a director or a supervising artist, it's so much more easier and safer to make a call about locking the work and proceeding linearly from that point on once you have the picture that is so clear and so advanced. And so eventually the post fit stage is a good candidate for potentially solving this classic clash between uh, creative flexibility and budget planning. As long as we can imagine uh, splitting the total budget into a budget for the phase that is the spiral pre post fit stage and everything that comes after. These kind of topics would be less convoluted to talk about if uh, um, VFX studios, of course, would ever um, turn into production studios and produce movies themselves, but that is a Pandora's box on its own. <laughs> the other very important thing that I wanted to say about workflows is this concept of abstraction and universalization, which is a process that is naturally happening across the world, uh, and it has been going on for a few years already. And basically, it's pretty clear that everybody across industries uh, is a bit tired of dealing with multiple standards and a million different technical specifications that come depending on how you started working 15, 20 years ago. 
everybody starting to converge towards shared tools, shared file formats, shared data flows, shared specifications, and shared practices. So it's not just uh, the two industries of game and movies that are converging, but it's internally of the industries themselves that uh, this universalization and normalizations of the procedures is happening. So the following are a few examples, and these are all common denominators across companies and across industries. For modeling and texturing, for example, photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is now for realistic looks, especially is a common denominator, like it's, it's kind of a standard process. PPR standards, they have brought a lot of consistencies across shader definitions and texturing processes. In animation, performance capture is not a special thing anymore, it's just a standard common first step. In character setup, well, common anatomies like common bipeds and common quadrupeds are pretty much standardized and the auto-rigging processes are pretty much the same always, especially if we focus on non-hero characters and creatures. In look dev and lighting, open shading language, Material X, ACS, are all going after the same effort of trying to standardize the process for everybody. Scene description and effects, USD, OpenVDB, Alembic, these are also very common formats that are now universal. Now, for rendering, it's still an open question because, as I mentioned before, we have a couple of candidates, one being high-density voxels, we're talking of submillimeter, submillimeter density real-time voxels, or uh, real-time micropolygons. So we're talking about the capability of rendering billions of polygons in real-time, at decent frame rates, of course, and uh, both of them are not on the table yet, but there are very promising results that clever teams have been putting out recently. And it might be a matter of one or two years, so maybe three, until it's in the end of everybody. Also, let's not forget the potential of cloud computing, the idea of sharing millions of uh, GPUs, uh, maybe on a blockchain system. It's very promising and can open a lot of doors. And also, just recently, NVIDIA has announced the Omniverse project, which is clearly along these lines. If you haven't checked it, I recommend to look up for it. But at the end of the day, the most crucial question mark here is the one between micropolygons or uh, microvoxels. Whichever will come first, uh, if we really will be able to uh, put movie quality assets straight into real-time engines and having them running with decent FPS ratios, uh, well, that will change a lot of things because, as, as we mentioned before, so much of the whole uh, slowdowns in the real-time processes uh, it's given by being still working on low-poly assets, uh, like the old-school way. And on top of this, we can expect artificial intelligence to come up and, uh, and make the processes even smoother in the future. And a few examples on how machine learning can make these processes easier are photo to clean mesh and photo to material processing, right? Starting from a set of properly taken photos, machine learning can process everything properly and do the whole step-by-step -step, uh, processing until a uh, clean mesh with materials is sped out. For animation, well, performance capture, curve, cleanup, that is a classic. And we've seen uh, recently, and we still are seeing, a lot of improvements into, into the field of uh, realistic face swapping, which indeed applies uh, to digital uh, facial animation. For character setup, well, background and crowd characters and standard uh, anatomies can be automatized with auto rigs, and those can be left in the hands of uh, artificial intelligence driven algorithms. Now, for look dev and lighting, all the processes that relate with onset data processing from the row to the scene, uh, meaning uh, stuff like isolating the source light out of HDRIs um, and uh, reproje spherical reprojection over uh, blockouts of the locations for proper indirect bounce and uh, character integrations on the blade, all of those things can be fed to an artificial intelligence system. Even though uh, all of this is also subject to <clears throat> the way giant lead walls technologies and the uh, light stages uh, um, will evolve uh, in the next years. Uh, and about this, uh, I suggest everybody to have a look at what uh, ILM is doing for the, on the StageCraft project. Now, scene description-wise, it's fascinating. We can you have procedural layout. Uh, artificial intelligence experiments uh, are already in place where there's a huge asset library, and uh, based on a few style requirements and a rough blockout, 
a final environment is built using the assets from the library. Now, please remember, this is not a full comprehensive uh, list, it's just a few examples, okay? And most of these artificial intelligence ideas are not meant to give you final results, are generally to give you a very nice uh, first pass that you can pick up from, and it's a very huge time saver, generally. But it's, it's worth and appropriate to specify here that, well, the easier these things become, the more automatized these things become, the more you can expect. I mean, enthusiasm for artificial intelligence is, is completely fine, but the more these things become easier, the more you can expect your salary to just go lower. We really have to protect our asses by keeping things real. Here we, we roll back to how I started the presentation and it was talking about how it's important for everybody to invest and build your own uniqueness in the industry. You have to create and mold your own unreplaceability. If a script can replace what you can do, then you need to take some action about it. And to close the chapter, in the case of rendering, um, well, for micropolygons, uh, well, photogrammetry to micropolygons is self-explanatory because you don't even need a, a clean mesh anymore. And uh, for voxel is the same as, as photogrammetry, would be voxelization out of photogrammetry. So you take pictures of stuff, you feed it to an algorithm that basically processes everything, cleans it up, projects all the material on the cleanup mesh and then renders out uh, a voxel description of it that can go in real time. So, um, I will skip the next slide, I will go really fast with it, because what this thing is, I called it uh, uh, Industry Ship Changer Turbo Guide. So it's uh, a little fly through of uh, what it takes today for a uh, movie industry person to transition to the gaming industry and vice versa. This is exactly what was not possible 20 years ago. Now, we won't go in the specifics of every single role or department uh, in the game or movie industries, that would be a little bit too much. But the core points to keep in mind for those who are considering an industry shift are, in terms of art foundations, in games and in movies, they are the same. Shape, form, color, contrast, visual composition, all the rules according to which a good picture looks good rather than bad are the same and they have been the same for 500 years now. They haven't changed. And in terms of picture quality and visual storytelling, they apply to movies as much as they apply to games. The tech is converging, the industries are converging, but they are not matching. Okay, so because of this there are still differences. You won't be able to seamlessly shift from games to movies or from movies to games uh, exclusively based on your skills. There is a shift of my, in mindset that is very important to keep in consideration. This is why I say that the main focus is on the overall difference in mindset because skills are overlappable. But the most important thing is that today's game and movie industries, they both welcome ship changers. And this is what was very hard 20 years ago, as I said already a bunch of times. And with shift in mindset, I mean things like if you are, for example, an artist moving from the game industry to the movie industry, you're going to have to be mentally prepared to start learning all the rituals uh, about uh, pixel fucking. While if you are a movie industry artist and moving into games, you still will need to like a bit more technical challenges because optimization is something that in games still happens and is it can be a bit daunting sometimes. And in more general terms, this is a very personal evaluation. I noticed that the two types, you know, the game person and the movie person, there is another aspect to which they are fairly different. Uh, when tackling a project or a, or a big task, movie people tend more toward looking at the global product at the big picture and then breaking it down into smaller tasks, smaller pieces, smaller elements. Um, while I've noticed that mentally video game people tend to naturally line up all the pieces first and then build them together so that the main product, the global output is then achieved. It might not make too much difference but workflow wise is quite an opposite mentality. And it might not even make too much sense, but really it's something that I just wanted to put out right there.
Now, don't worry, I will skip this slide. It's a bit too much. I don't want to kill anybody. Uh, it was meant to touch upon the main roles in the industry, uh, but it, it can be a little bit vague and can be very hit and, hit and miss in general. I will be around after the presentation, so if you just come by, uh, maybe I can share this, this slide with you. And anyway, the presentation is being recorded, uh, so hopefully it will make it to YouTube at some point. And you will be able to just stop the video and read through. But in general, the main point is the same that I was mentioning before. If you are a movie artist uh, moving into games, you will really have to be open for understanding and suffering a bit through all the, all the, the technicalities that are still necessary to make assets run in real time. And if you're moving from games into movies, uh, you're going to have to be open into accepting into your mentality an extra layer of pickiness, pixel perfection, which also can be fairly difficult to absorb if, if you're not used to it. So at the end of the day, uh, too many technicalities might frustrate an artist that from movies moves into games, and too much artistic expectation and detail expectations uh, might frustrate a game artist that moves into movies. Now, that sounds like uh, several differences, right? Weren't games and movies converging? Well, yes, they are converging, not matching yet. Maybe at some point they will, but for now they are not the same thing yet. The positive fact is that ship changes are very welcome. The movie industry will need more game people, and the video game industry will need more movie people. And related to how the workforce is evolving and changing, uh, let's see how companies are evolving and changing. And as both industries are either approaching or deep into their stage of saturation, uh, there is a whole generation of professionals that progressively is getting fed up by working in the same conditions over and over, especially being part of huge corporations. For many reasons, many are political, many are ideological uh, working conditions, but the result is that it's happening over and over that independent uh, studios, small boutiques, uh, independent small boutiques are appearing in the industry very successfully and they are started by industry veterans that just gather together out of the big studios and becoming independent that way. And this is positive because it creates a more dynamic scenario in the industry. And this is possible also because of the new opportunities that are there today for smaller businesses, which are given by tech advancements and networking speed security, self-publishing and distribution, uh, simplified licensing models, uh, rentable resources and cloud computing, and also higher and more diverse demand in new contents, not just entertainment, but also serious contents, such as uh, uh, educational, medical, automotive, space research, and so on. We will see that the way huge corporations and small independent boutiques will coexist will be a matter of sustainability. And the overall sustainability balance between big studios and small boutiques, uh, it's given obviously by the fact that big studios, they have many more resources, but at the same time, they are much bigger machines and they cannot really change that flexibly. While on the other side, the small boutiques, they can change much better because they are small and flexible, but obviously they have limited resources. So let's put for a second side by side big studios and boutiques points, okay? The big studios are generally more open and they have more jobs, so they are more reachable and more exposed, at least their front door. The working style inside of them is more assembly line-like, uh, things are more streamlined, and because of this also they are more prone for specialization, right? You dif it's difficult to wear too many hats inside of a big studio. In the end, the successful type is willing to invest in a big structure, blend in, stick around and move up. Something like this. On the other side, the boutiques are tendentially more elitarian and less jobs because they are smaller and, and less exposed. Their working style is more freestyle and because of this is more prone to generalism, which can be more fun to certain type of people, or, but can be also harder sometimes. Eventually, the successful type in a small boutique is willing to invest in a familiar environment and just shine independently. Something more like this. Now, don't misunderstand this, they have both their pros and cons, and the ideal situation is to try them both and then decide which kind of type you are. I think it's appropriate to spend a word about remote work because it's something that has been discussed many times, these days especially. And sometimes these discussions, they skip on very important points and make remote work sound like something that is just uh, this amazing thing that uh, uh, we are so stupid that we are not just doing it globally by default in every kind of job. 
And most likely, remote work is not impossible, but there are very, very serious uh, points that need to be solved and organized, and then there is a mentality change that needs to be you know, tackled for it to become a real reality. I'm going to pop this picture back again uh, because I think it's interesting, right? I showed it before. This is, this is one of our screen share sessions, remote screen share se sessions with the technical guys at Unity when we were developing the Heretic project. And it's interesting because of the amount of topics uh, and, and questions and problems that we were tackling, uh, overlapping them on top of each other. So important points that need to be uh, kept in mind when considering remote work are you need a solid and reliable network and repository setup and data flow, which means that you need a proper IT infrastructure infrastructure that allows for everybody to work seamlessly. And the bigger the team, the more complex this becomes. There is a certain sheer experience, communication and anticipation skills that you need to be able to work remotely. Sometimes we imagine working remotely and automatically, obviously, we think of transposing ourselves into a remote work starting from where we are right now, which would mean working remotely with the people that we are already used to work in an office with. So they are all people that we already been sharing the same room with that we know fairly closely. But the idea of working remotely by default means that as a company or a team expands, uh, the new people, you might get to never see them or like not interact with them as much. So the more time passes working remotely only, the more you're dealing with people that you barely know in person. And as a matter of fact, my personal experience is that remote work leaves close to no space for mentorship or micro troubleshooting, meaning that a junior professional, somebody or an internship that starts uh, for the first time working professionally, is very hard to mentor such a person uh, from the beginning going up. Obviously, time zones might be an obstacle. And then there are rights and confidentiality issues and policies that need to be rearranged, especially when dealing with big, big important franchises. But overall, there is a human side into sharing the same physical space with other people that is important, and we forget about it sometimes. Uh, in any job, there are moments of hardship. Uh, there are moments uh, that are very, very difficult to go through because there is too much to do, but because we are late, because we don't know how to get out of certain problems. And being physically in the same room altogether, I think that is, uh, is a qu quite energizing and quite motivating for, for, for the team to just fuel each other with motivation. I generally would be surprised to discover that everybody is the type of person that doesn't need that. There are several interesting projects being developed now, uh, which you should keep an eye on, um, about uh, the idea of virtual office, uh, meaning having the possibility of, uh, through virtual reality, share the same space with, uh, with the realistic avatars with your colleagues and people you're working with. That might make a difference. But with that said, remote work is something that should be seriously considered for the future in general. From a more global standpoint, this idea of having humanity completely concentrated into small spots of the planet and we live all condensed in cities and we live stacked vertically, uh, suffering all the speculations of real estate uh, while there are so many very vast areas uh, in every continent that are just beautiful with a fantastic climate uh, that are relatively uninhabited and that is just generally awkward and very unhealthy so changing it wouldn't be that much of a bad idea and together with remote work the other huge hot topic that uh, it, you hear everywhere is artificial intelligence we mentioned it uh, a little bit earlier let's mention it again to hit the question that everybody asks all the time are we all going to be left unemployed because an artificial intelligence software will take our place? My bullshit free answer is not everybody, but somebody should start worrying. First, we need to demystify a little bit uh, artificial intelligence because there is no magic, there is no voodoo in artificial intelligence. It's literally search algorithms that uh, fetch and feed to and from databases to create conditional probability structures and infer certain sentences. So there is no magic, but the point is that when these systems will be trained enough to write their own code and expand themselves by their, without having human intervention, then is when the human brain is going to be set out of the process and we can actually start worrying at that point. But until then, here is the list that I've brought of those people that are literally under threat right now. And it is 
anybody involved in photogrammetry processing, motion curves cleanup, match move and camera tracking, HDRI and onset data processing and prepping, background crowd rigging and animation, maintaining NPCs, non playing characters for artificial intelligence, rotoscope, rotor paint, stereo conversion, and I would also add uh, digital double facial animation. These people should be worried. If you don't worry, if you do these things, if your job is completely this and you don't worry, that means that you probably don't care too much about your career. The hybrid future. So there are many, 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 many uh, consequences of these things that we talk about here today. But the most important ones is you can see it in certain products already, right? Games. They're becoming more story driven. We have seen it, right? The grammar of movies is influencing them. Together with the idea of having a story that makes them flow better, they're also becoming easier to lessen the frustration of dealing with them. Nobody wants to play a game that is frustrating to go through. As a consequence, there are more casual gamers. The target and spectrum of gamers is broadening exponentially these years. Games are also being designed to have a more bite-size kind of scale, also to match the necessities of today's daily life. More generally speaking, they are more open for everybody to put their hands on them at uh, any given moment. And they are becoming more voyeuristic. Uh, what does this mean? Well, most video games being developed these days, they are not being created just with the idea of being fun to play, but also with the idea of being fun to watch while somebody else is playing. Because there is a huge business behind watching other people playing games. If you think of any platform for streaming and how many gamers on YouTube or Twitch have made a business out of that, there are huge esports events that are filling entire stadiums these days. And it turns out that there are many, many people that, enjoy, that actually enjoy more watching other people playing a game rather than playing it themselves. So there is a lot of research in AI player modeling which means having an artificial intelligence that simulates how a human would play a game, which results in having a gameplay that appears like on the other side there is a human playing, but then eventually there is control to skill up and level up the skills of the player pretty much infin infinitely, way beyond what a human could ever achieve. And this is obviously triggered by the fact that the better the player, the more viewers it can attract. So in general, we can say that video games are being developed according to their play value as much as their watch value. About movies, well, we have more interactive movies, right? Bandersnatch, you think of Soderbergh's Mosaic, or even Detroit Become Human. I don't even know if that is more of a video game movie or a movie video game. More interactive movies leading to more immersive experiences. And today, there is not only the idea of pre-release movie marketing, but also the idea of post-release movie marketing. If you think about a movie that has been developed with very high-end virtual production techniques, a post-marketing for the franchise could potentially be releasing the locations themselves um, for, the, for the people to walk inside of them, like if they were visiting the locations where this movie was shot. And this might lead to a very interesting concept that would be the sandbox movies, which is what we were mentioning before when talking about emergent movie making. It would be creating a location with actors and a performance, and then eventually the version that the director puts out is just his or her version. Then the audience can take over and experiment with other ways of telling the same story or different stories, making the most of that location and the actor's performance. And generally, probably the most important point is we brought it up a bunch of times during the, the talk. Viewers becomes closer to the directors. The experience that the viewers leave being part of the movie, it's closer to the one that the content creators have when creating the movie. So this is another way of looking at this convergence when movies are becoming more interactive and games are becoming more voyeuristic. So the point is that, uh, you know, I close is that there is this hybrid future that just opens a lot of things. What I mentioned before about saturating content and industry sat getting saturated can be defeated. And one good candidate medicine for this is embracing this uh, future where, where game technologies are 
empowering movie makers and uh, the movie legacy is empowering the, the, the game experience. Uh, we all look back at uh, the pioneering stage of the industry, well, of any industry to be fair, and the pioneering stage is always the stage where it looks like everything is up for discovery and there is so much space for invention and exploration. And then these invention slots that are originally are empty, they get filled up and up and up, and then eventually everything becomes saturated and there is no space for inventing anything anymore. We are just stuck with the option of improving what's already being invented or sticking with repetition over and over and over. But by being sensitive to how the world is changing and how our industry can potentially evolve, well, there are options and there are weapons that we can use to defeat that saturation of contents that our industries are admittedly suffering these years. So my hope with this presentation is to expose some of the ideas and the possibilities that are there for us to catch in the, in the upcoming future. And hopefully now you have fresh elements to draw your own conclusions on where our industries are going in the next years. And with this said, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this is it. You made it through. <laughs>